My story starts when I was living in a city in southern China called Guangzhou. And as somebody who studies culture, I'm always observing other people's behavior. And so one thing that I noticed while I was living there was that the supermarkets were very crowded, and frequently people would um, accidentally bump into me. And I would notice that when they would bump into me, they would often sort of tense up, look at the floor, and sort of shuffle away quietly. Uh, it seemed to me that people here were really focused on avoiding conflict. But a few months later, I visited a city in northern China called Harbin, and I went with my uh, American roommate, David, shown here in traditional Chinese garb. Uh, and we were visiting a museum, and uh, an employee at the museum said, wow, your, your Chinese is very good, um, but your Chinese, and she pointed to me, is better than your Chinese, and she pointed to David. Now, I've known David for seven years. In fact, I saw him a couple months ago in New York City, and I can tell you that we have never brought this up again, if that's any indication of how uncomfortable it made us feel to have our Chinese levels um, compared. And so it seems to me that people in northern China were a little bit less concerned about sort of preserving harmony. So over several years of living in China, uh, I found that people in the north were a bit more outgoing, a bit more independent, uh, whereas people in southern China were a little bit more what I thought of when I th before I came to China, um, so interdependent, shy around strength, is focused on, on uh, avoiding conflict. So this got me to thinking over several years of living in China, why do these differences exist? What are some of the systematic differences between northern and southern China? Well, one of the differences is that south of the Yangtze River, for thousands of years, people have been growing rice for a living. But if you look at the at other crops like wheat, it's the exact opposite. So north of the Yangtze River, people have been growing wheat. Now, why would rice be important for culture? Uh, I think there are two things that make rice really different from any other crop that people grow around the world. First is that it requires irrigation. Irrigation is important because rice farmers have to coordinate when they fill and when they drain their fields. Uh, it means that my water use affects your water use. This makes people um, have functional interdependence. This isn't some you know, sky, pie in the sky, we all love each other. It's, it's we have to work together in order to put food on the table. The second thing is that rice requires a lot of labor. How do we know that it requires a lot of labor? Well, first we can just compare the number of tasks that farming rice and farming wheat um, requires. And you can see that rice requires a lot more tasks than, than wheat. Uh, but anthropologists have studied this more systematically by visiting pre-modern rice villages and wheat villages and observing the number of hours that farmers have to spend in their fields. And what they routinely find is that rice farmers have to spend about twice the number of hours in their fields uh, as wheat farmers. Now, why is this important? It's important because such a large labor burden um, encourages rice farmers to form these cooperative labor exchanges. So I will help you farm your field this week, and you'll help me form, uh, farm my field next week. So in a nutshell, the rice theory of culture is the idea that rice has a higher need for collective labor, uh, and over time those cultures become more collectivistic. Wheat cultures have less of a need for collective labor, um, and that's, that leads to more of the freedom that we associate with individualism. Now, I've tested this in China by going to different testing sites all over China and giving people psychological tests and seeing whether or not they're actually different, these cultures. Um, so one of the ways in which I've tested this is to, to measure people's implicit individualism. Now, the way that we, we do this is we have people draw a sociogram um, to represent the self and their friends. And what we don't tell them is that afterwards we measure the size of the self and we measure the size of the friends to see whether or not they draw the self bigger than they draw their friends. We, we consider this a sort of implicit or, or unconscious measure of individualism. Now, previous research has shown that Americans are number one in the world in self-inflation. We draw ourselves <laughs> much bigger than we draw our friends. Uh, people in Western Europe are, uh, you know, they have self-inflation, but they're a little bit less. Uh, and people in Japan actually draw the self slightly smaller than they draw their friends. Now, I thought uh, Japan as another rice culture um, should be similar to, to Southern China. And I thought that people in the wheat parts of China would be a little bit more like people in Western Europe. And indeed, that's what I found. So people in the wheat parts were showing the self-inflation. People in, from the rice parts of China were not. Another way that I've tested this is to look at people's cultural thought style. Now, you might be familiar with the idea that individualistic thought is linked to analytic, uh, or, I'm sorry, individualistic cultures tend to have more analytic thought. Uh, people in collectivistic cultures t tend to think more holistically or intuitively. We use different terms. Um, you might be familiar with the West's tradition of the sort of abstract philosophical thought. And I said, I thought, well, if, if that's really linked to this individualism and northern China is more individualistic, we should find more of that abstract analytic thought in northern China, and we should see more traditional thought in southern China. Uh, one way that psychologists measure this is to give people items to categorize. So we'll give you three objects, and we'll say, choose two that you think go together. Now, in each of these triads, uh, two of them can be paired together because they belong to the same abstract category. So, for example, the mitten and a scarf um, are both items of winter clothing in an abstract sense. 
Um, but a, and there's a, the second way you can pair these up is a more sort of intuitive relational pairing. Uh, the hand wears the mitten. Now what I'm going to show you is the percentage of rice that's grown in people's home provinces where they grew up and the percentage of these uh, intuitive categorizations, you could think of this as uh, traditional East Asian thought. Um, and what I find is that indeed people from the, the rice areas of China have more of this sort of traditional East Asian thought. Um, and here's where students at UVA score, um, another weak culture. Uh, so at this point, you might be asking yourself, is it really rice? There's lots of differences between northern and southern China, for example, temperature, um, lots of other cultural variables. How do we know that it's rice and not some other third variable? Well, one way that, that we can get at this question is to look at the provinces just along the rice wheat border. Um, so just these provinces just along the Yangtze River. And what we can do is we can zoom into the county level and we can look at, the, at these nearby counties that differ very little in terms of latitude, in terms of temperature, um, but differ very strongly in terms of how much rice and how much wheat they grow. Um, and so that's exactly what I did. So here, for example, is the differences in thought style for northern and southern China as a whole. And what I'm going to show you here are the differences in thought style for people just along those neighboring counties along the rice wheat border. And what we find are similar differences. So after I did all of these laboratory studies, I thought, you know, laboratory studies are really great because we know exactly what we're measuring, we're, we're putting people in a controlled environment, we're being very careful about it. But I thought, if these cultures are really so different, we should be able to find some of these differences in the real world. I wanted to get out and study, you know, people's concrete everyday behavior. Um, so I got a Fulbright, op uh, Fulbright scholarship and I had the opportunity to go do observational studies in China. Um, so the things that I was... Uh, wanted to do while I was there required a, some sort of comparable environment. So I was trying to think, what could be an environment in China that is this, basically the same all over China, that, that can be my sort of natural experiment room? What's, what sort of environment doesn't change no matter where you go, um, anywhere through China? And I was thinking about this problem, I couldn't figure out where is a good uh, sort of natural experiment room, and one day it hit me. Starbucks. <laughs> Um, thanks to the, <laughs> the, the wonders of global capitalism, um, I had my experiment room all set for me. So you know, basically the same all over China. And the first thing that I did is I wanted to start pretty simple. So I just went in and I counted the number of people who were sitting alone um, in several cities in the rice area and the wheat area. And in Beijing, it was about 30-35% uh, of people were sitting alone. Uh, Beijing's in the, the wheat area. Um, and then in Shanghai and Hong Kong in the rice area, it was closer to 20% of people were sitting alone. Now this was pretty easy, and after this I wanted to take it up a notch. Um, so I wanted to study uh, what psychologists are interested in is changing the environment. So in, in cultural psychology there's this idea that if you encounter a problem in the environment and you're from an individualistic culture, you're more likely to want to change the environment to solve that problem. Uh, but if you encounter that same problem and you're from a collectivistic culture, you might be more likely to want to change the self to fit into the environment. And so I was thinking about how do I, how do I study this? And, and one day it, it again hit me with these Starbucks. Uh, I went to a Starbucks and I would move the chairs together so that they were blocking the aisle. And then I would sit nearby and count how many people moved themselves to fit through the chair and how many people would move the chairs. Um, and that was it. Um, to keep it uh, the same across environments, across the different Starbucks, I would always move the chairs so that they were the width of my hips. And uh, just to give you an idea of how hard that is to get through, that's a picture of me trying to get through um, those chairs. It was quite difficult. So I first did this in Guangzhou in the rice area, and I, I sat nearby, and 3% of people that I observed, over 100 people, only three of them moved the chair. And this, this surprised me. I mean, I thought it would be low, Guangzhou is in the rice area, um, but that, that really just, it, it struck me as, as crazy. I mean, we're talking about, I saw multiple people go through and then line up and file through one by one in these empty chairs. <laughs> Remember that I'm not sitting in the chair, right? Uh, I saw people with multiple bags hold their bags up and sort of shuffle through the chairs. It really shocked me. I mean, I thought it would be low, but not that low. So next I went to Hong Kong, which is an, another uh, city in the rice area, although it's slightly different because it has a history of, of um, you know, colonization with the United Kingdom. Um, it's also much more modernized, so I wasn't exactly sure what I would find there. Um, but after all the, the data was in, it was 4%, basically the same. So again, I was shocked at this. And at this point, I was starting to get worried that maybe I'd, I had designed a broken experiment, right? Because I didn't go to the handbook of cultural psychology and under how to study whether or not people are changing the environment, it says push the chairs together in Starbucks. No, I, I made this up, right? I mean, it was just something that I, I made up in, in my free time. Um, and so I thought, you know, Maybe it's just that 
nobody wants to move the chair, right? Maybe my hips are too wide for Chinese people. Uh, you know, I don't know exactly why. I was just worried that I had spent all this time inconveniencing people across China uh, <laughs> just to run a broken experiment. So I went up to Beijing, the first, uh, this, the first city in the, the wheat area that I was going to study, and I was pushing the chairs together. And when I would push them together, I wouldn't push them all the way at once because I didn't want to make it so obvious that there was a strange white guy pushing chairs together in the Starbucks. Um, so I'd push, I'd, I'd push them maybe you know 50%, 60%, 70% of the way together um, just to make it a little bit less obvious. And I was doing this with the very first set of chairs in Beijing. And I wasn't even, you know, 100, the chairs weren't even 100% together. Uh, and then a woman walked by and she looked at the chairs and, huh. And then she moved the chair. And when I say moved the chair, I mean she moved the chair from here all the way over there. And at that point, I thought, all oh, right, yeah, Beijing's different. Uh, and indeed, <laughs> close to 20% of people in, in Beijing uh, moved the chair. So indeed, I was onto something. So what? Why is any of this important? Well, first, I hope I've convinced you that, that Han China is not just a single culture. There's 1.2 billion Han Chinese people, um, and they're very different. This has implications for things like the economy, politics, trade. Uh, if I were in charge of marketing for Coca-Cola in China, I'd want to know about these differences. Second, uh, it's not just China that has the, a rice-wheat split. India is another country with over a billion people that has a rice-wheat split. Um, and I've replicated my findings in India, so this is um, the percentage of rice uh, in people's home states in India, and that's their uh, traditional thought style. Uh, and finally, I think it can help explain a, a modern paradox. So a lot of us have the intuition that modernization leads to individualism, that as countries modernize, they become more individualistic. Uh, but there's a bit of a problem. So I'm from East Lansing, Michigan, not a terribly modernized place, not a terribly urbanized place. Uh, and I visited these cities in East Asia that, that are much more urbanized, much more modernized um, than where I'm from, places like Hong Kong, places like Tokyo. And secondly, if you look at per capita GDP, so for example, if we compare Western Europe, which is here, the, the blue line, uh, and, and several countries in East Asia, uh, Japan caught up to Western Europe in the 1970s, uh, Singapore caught up in the 1990s. Some of these places now have per capita GDPs that are higher than, than in the West. And yet when you look at their individualism, uh, and if you plot it out by, by how wealthy the, the per capita GDPs of these countries are, and how individualistic they are in, based on uh, studies in psychology, indeed you find a relationship so that wealthier countries tend to be more individualistic. But all of East Asia is an outlier. All of East Asia is less individualistic than it should be based on how wealthy it is. So what could explain this? What are some of these, the, the commonalities between all of these countries? Well, all of these countries here that are outliers, they're all rice cultures or colonized by people from, from rice cultures. So I think the rice theory could help explain a little bit of this um, sort of East Asian paradox. So thanks for listening. And I also like to thank everybody who helped me do all of these studies in China. Thanks.